So um, we're kind of moving back in time here. We've been doing section three, three, and then section three, four. And now I'm somehow, for some reason, I'm jumping back here to section three, two. This is section 3.2. And there's two big ideas in this section. One of them is Rolls theorem. Uh, so let me explain to you what Rolls theorem is. I hope that you've already watched the video that I posted in Canvas, because if you've done that, then everything I say today is just going to add on to your uh, exposure to these ideas. Um, Rolls theorem basically says this. If this function here, f, function f, if it is continuous and differentiable on an interval, and we know that f of a is equal to f of b, then there has to be some point C where the derivative there is equal to zero. That probably makes no sense, right? <laughs> Here's what it's essentially saying. Let's, let's put some numbers in here and make this a little bit more concrete. Let's say that this is one. Let's say that this is five. Let's say that this is two. Actually, let's make it three just to be fair. Yeah. It's probably three because it's a parabola, right? Doesn't have to be in the middle though, but in this case it does because it's a problem. Let's say that this over here is four, okay? Would you guys agree that this curve is continuous from A to B? Sure, fine. Would you agree it's differentiable? In other words, would you agree that we can draw the tangent line anywhere on that curve? And the answer is yes, we can. Would you agree that F of one is equal to F of five? A is 1, B is 5, F of 1 is 4, correct? What's F of 5? It is also 4. Then this theorem says there has to be some value of C, in this case it would be 3, where the derivative is equal to 0. Here's actually what the theorem is talking about. Let's, I'm going to get away from this verbiage up here. Guess what we call this line right here? We call it a, a secant line. You guys remember we talked about secant lines and tangent lines all the way back at the beginning of chapter two? That's a secant line. And what's the slope of that secant line? Mm -hmm. Zero. The slope of this secant line is a zero. What's this green line up here? What's that called? It's called a tangent line. What's the slope of this particular tangent line? Here's what the theorem says. The theorem saying is if you have a function that's continuous and differentiable, and we know that the average rate of change, that's the slope of the secant line, if the average rate of change is zero, then somewhere between those other two guys, the instantaneous rate of change also has to be zero. Let's look at an example of that. So first of all, let's make sure that we can do this. Is F, let's do this very first thing, is F, continuous and differentiable on the interval that we're talking about. Well, first of all, what kind of function is it? It's polynomial, right? Polynomial functions are continuous everywhere, right? Is it differentiable everywhere? In other words, can we find the derivative of this guy? Would you guys agree with that? So that's good. We've met two of the three things. Check, check. What was the other thing we needed to check? Well, the other thing we needed to check Number two is we need to figure out that f of a has to equal f of b. But there's a problem here. Guess what we have not figured out yet? a or b. That comes from this, the x-intercepts. How do you find the x-intercepts of a curve? Well, to find the x-intercepts, you put y equals. So we're just going to change this to a 0. So 0 equals x squared minus 5x plus 6. So 0 is going to be equal to x minus 2, x minus 3. So what are our intercepts, our x-intercepts? They're 2 and 3. So would you agree that f of 2 is equal to f of 3 in this example? Because they're both equal to 0. Agreed? So now I have all three criteria checked. I've established that this function is continuous, which was super easy because it's a polynomial. I've established that it's differentiable because it's a polynomial, duh, no problem. I've also established in this particular problem that's asking me about the x-intercepts, 
I can clearly see that f of a, this is a, this is b, are the same. In other words, the average rate of change is zero. What does Rolle's theorem uh, conclude then? Therefore, by Rolle's theorem, there has to be some c where the derivative is also equal to zero. The bad news about Rolle's theorem is, is guess what? It doesn't tell you. It doesn't tell you where c is. So we got to find C. So let's see if we can figure out where C is. So the question is, oops, yeah, we'll do it in blue. The question is, where is C? Well, this is actually a super easy example to deal with. Let's talk about the derivative. What's the derivative of two, uh, x squared minus 5x plus 6? It'd be 2x minus 5. And guess what we want that derivative to equal? Well, we want it to equal zero. So guess what x is? 5 over 2 or 2.5. And by the way, guess what c is there for? And there's, there's your answer. What's with the three dots? Is that the therefore? Yep. If you like to write the word therefore out, you can. I like you to do the three dots. It just looks cooler. Do you guys know what this means? Nope. <laughs> Means the end of a proof, or it's been shown, or I've, done, I've completed everything I need to do for this problem. You'll see that if you get into higher level math courses. Oh, by the way, let's talk about this guy real quick. I can't remember if I put the picture on here, which I did. Let me do that over here. Guys, what kind of curve was this? It was a parabola. Which way did it open? It opens up, agree? So there's my parabola. Where did it cross the x-axis at? Two and three, right? So right here is two. Here is three. Guess what this point is right there? 2.5. Guess what the slope of the tangent line is right there? A zero. And this is obviously a super easy example. We'll do a more interesting one on the next one. But let me go back and, and go through this theorem one more time. Rolle's theorem states that if f is continuous and differentiable on an interval, and if we know that f of a equals f of b, then there has to be at least one number c in that interval such that f of c is equal to zero. Now, I want to point out a couple of issues here. Th these are warnings. The first warning is this. Roll theorem does not tell you where C is. That's what typically the problem is for you to do, is to figure out where C is at. Most questions involving Rolle's theorem, they'll ask you to figure out what C is. The other problem is this right here. <laughs> Guess what C could be? It could be multiple values. So C could be, oops, not me, uh, multiple values. So be careful. Um, the example I just did here, there was only one value of C, 2.5. There are other examples I could easily come up with where there's 10 values of C or 20 or 100 or whatever. So, okay. So that's Rolle's theorem. Oh, I think there's one other thing I should mention. Does Rolle's theorem apply to this particular graph, this function? Let's work backwards. Is f of a equal to f of b? Check. Is the function continuous from a to b? Check. Is the function differentiable on the interval a to b? Uncheck. Rolle's theorem does not apply here. In fact, you can check on that particular uh, interval, there are no values where f prime is equal to zero. And the reason is, is because this criteria fails. Because if you guys remember, do you guys remember what we call a point like that? 
think I've mentioned it several times. It's a stupid point word all day. Oh, yeah, yeah. The derivative at a cusp is D and E. Rule's theorem only applies to functions that are continuous and differentiable. That's also one of the reasons why in this class we always talk about continuity and differentiability. Because if continuity doesn't exist and or differentiability doesn't exist, then a lot of our theorems and calculus don't work. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and talk about the more important of the two theorems today, and that's the mean value theorem. This is most important. In fact, let me get this out of the way right now. If you know this theorem, you actually already have Rolle's theorem. Rolle's mm -hmm. theorem is just a subset of the mean value theorem. Here's what happened. Rolle came out with, his, by the way, Rolle's the name of a mathematician. He is given credit for Rolle's theorem. It turned out that in math, we like to generalize things and open them up more. Rolle's theorem is specific. In fact, let me write this up here. Rolle's theorem is the case where the slope is zero. Guess what the mean value theorem is? It is exactly the same thing, except the slope could be any number. In fact, it could even be D and E in some cases. You could have a vertical tangent line or something like that. Anyways, uh, notice that the setup is basically the same. If F is continuous and different, uh, differentiable, then there has to exist a C on the interval for which this is true. And all this is saying is, by the way, I hope you're familiar with that formula right there. Let me write it in a different way. Are you guys familiar with that formula? <laughs> From algebra one, slope formula. This is the slope of the secant line formula, if you will. Guess what this is the slope of? Slope of the tangent line. Graphically, that's what you're doing here. You're saying, in fact, let me just go to this picture here. This is the secant line. This is the tangent line. Guess what's true about their two slopes in this picture? They're parallel. They're equal. The ends are equal. That's what this theorem is saying. If the slope of the secant line was, let's say, a half, then the slope of the tangent line somewhere also would have to be a half. The other thing is, is that this here is the average rate of change. And this is the instantaneous rate of change. Guys, all of this stuff over here is algebra one, basically. This is the calculus component. Okay, so I'm going to go over one more example. Um, actually, I've got another one too, but um, we'll see how, how we're doing on time. So I need to make sure we got time for our virtual stuff. I'm just going to forewarn you that this problem is a little bit harder than the first one. And the reason it's harder is because I'm going to cover stuff that you maybe have forgotten from pre-calc. And that's why I'm actually doing it. Um, a lot of the videos I try to do nice, easy polynomial functions. So everyone's kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is an example of one that is, is um, well, we're dealing with transcendental functions, like the natural log or the square root of x, okay? Um, actually, you know what? Before we do this, let me sketch something for you, just to make sure you're familiar with it. Does anybody know what that graph is right there? There was eight graphs at the beginning of the year I said you should know. Does anybody recall what that one is? It's e to the x. Opportunity number two. Uh, that's not a very good picture. But anyway, it's kind of like, what's that one? I'll give you a hint. It's the inverse of this one. The natural log of x. You, you should know that. It's one of the list of eight I said at the beginning of the year you should have these. But anyway, so there you go. I just want to make sure we're familiar with that. Um, by the way, this square root doesn't change much. Um, I'm telling you for this function here, the domain is 0 to infinity. I'll just point that out before we begin the example, okay? The, the, in fact, the graph of this is actually very similar to that green graph over there. 
So we're going to try to verify that this uh, is true for the mean value theorem. And what are the only two criteria for determining if this is uh, okay to use the mean value theorem on? There's only two things. What are they? Continuity. We need to make sure it's continuous and it's differentiable. Okay. And specifically, we need to be worried about this interval right here. Oh, I guess I should talk about E. Do you guys know what E is? Does anybody remember what E is, the number? It's 2 point something. That's exactly right. It's 2.718 approximately. It goes on, right? It's just like pi. So basically, this graph here is very similar to the graph we're going to be looking at. And so we're interested at 1, there's where 1 would be, and then wherever E is, which again is 2.718, right? So you see the screen graph? Is it continuous? From 1 to E, is it continuous, the green graph? Yeah. Yes. So I would say uh, F of X is continuous on uh, 1 E since the domain is 0 to infinity. As long as I'm anywhere between 0 and infinity, it's continuous. Okay. Is it differentiable? Well, let me ask you this. You see that green graph over there? Can you draw a tangent line on there anywhere you wanted between 1 and E? A unique tangent line. Yep, you can Let's go ahead and find the derivative. So f of x is differentiable. I guess this is a this is all number. I guess this is all a. Let me try that again. We'll call this uh, a. And this is I'll say part one, and then the first part two. It is differentiable. And let's go ahead and find the derivative. Uh, you guys know how to find the derivative of that? This is where people start looking away from me because they don't remember their derivative rules from chapter two. What is the derivative of ln of x? It's one over x, that's exactly right. So we need to do one over the square root of x, but then we have to multiply by the derivative of the square root of x. And what is the derivative of the square root of x? Well, it's, uh, oops, it's not two. One over two square roots of x. And by the way, what is the square root of x times the square root of x? It's x. Therefore, f prime is equal to one over two x. That is the derivative function for our graph. And by the way, we need to be careful. The domain of our original function is zero to infinity. Guess what the domain of this function has to also be? Or less. Because remember, x can't be zero there, right? You plug zero into that function, you've got a problem. We've got the derivative. We have continuity and we have differentiability. Therefore, therefore, MBT applies. Okay? So we have verified that MBT applies. I highly encourage you on problems, particularly if it was on a quiz or a test. I, honestly, I don't think I would ever give you one where it didn't apply just to like say, ha ha, I got you. But they can do that on the AP exam. In fact, they're notorious for doing that kind of stuff. They'll say like on the free response, they'll say, does, is this, does MVT apply to this function? And you have to, you have to explain, is it continuous and it's differential? So let's go ahead and go on to the next slide here because I got to do some work now. Uh, what was the formula for the mean value theorem? F prime of C equals F of B minus F of A over B minus A. Oh, and by the way, I should note that A in this case was 1 and B was E, I think, all right? Oh, and I should probably mention that uh, Y or F, I guess I should call it that, F or Y is equal to the natural log of the square root of X. And its derivative, I think we came up with 1 over 2x. Agree? Now I'm just going to plug all that jazz into this formula. Uh, let's see here. 
f prime of c has to equal, let's see here, that'd be the natural log of the square root of, and what was b again? e minus the natural log the square root of, what was a? Over e minus 1. Anybody know what the natural log of 1 is? Is that my something? Red hot chili peppers going for some reason. I mean, we just I like the red hot chili peppers. I'm not really quite sure where that's going to play, but good for you. That was Under the Bridge by Red Hot Chili Peppers, one of my favorite songs. Anyways. You're talking really just about Okay, back where I was. Guys, what's the natural log of one? It's zero. By the way, if you plug one in here, what's the square root of one? What's the natural log of one? Zero. Okay. So that's zero. In fact, I'll make a little purple sign. That's gonna this part's gonna go to zero. Agree? Mm -hmm. Anybody know what that is? Okay, so let's do a little bit of work with that. So again, I, I told you I'm doing this problem on purpose because people forget stuff they learned in pre-calc. Would you agree that square root is the same thing as e to the one half? Mm -hmm. And by our logarithm properties, you would agree I could put the one half in front of that, right? By the way, what's the logarithm of e? What's the logarithm of e? So that's one half. Okay, so that tells us that we get the following answer. We get um, one half over e minus one which is equal to 1 over 2 e minus 1. This is the right-hand side. That's the slope of r. Would someone do me a favor? Get your calculator out, because I'm going to ask you a question here in just a second. Would someone find out roughly what this is equal to? By the way, this is a, there's no variables in this. I'd like you to figure out what that is. Be ready. I'll call on you in a minute. The whole thing? Just this right here. 1 divided by 2 times e minus 1 quantity. Anyways. Okay, so now I've got to deal with this side over here. So this right here, what is it? Like 0 0.29. 1. 1. Okay, fair enough. Good enough. Okay. Whatever. Good. Thank you. So this is approximately this value. Now, remember, the mean value theorem tells us that f prime of some c value has to equal that. Well, well what's f prime? How do you solve that equation? I'd just cross multiply, wouldn't you? Of course. So you'll get 2x equals 2 quantity e minus 1. Guess what happens to the 2s? They cancel. By the way, that's c. Would someone help me out with that too? Do you, actually, I can do that one in my head. <laughs> uh, e was 2.718, right? So if I minus 1 from that, that is approximately 1.718. Agreed? I told you this is a harder example, didn't I? Now, you guys, thankfully, have been able to help me out with your calculators. So let's go ahead and look at our picture here. This red curve, this red curve right here is f of x equals the natural log of the square root of x. Guess what this point is right here? What x value? By the way, what was the other endpoint? E, right? What's E again? 2.7. Oh, there it is. So right, right around here is E. Okay. So that gives us this point right here. Now, do you see that black line? Guess what that black line is called? The secant, the secant line. line. Guess what its slope turns out to be? You see this green line right here? That's the tangent line. Guess what its slope turns out to be? Point, point 0.290, right? Oh, by the way, what did I say E minus 1 was? 1.718, right? Holy cow. 
Now, I don't know if you guys can appreciate this, but we did all of that with calculus stuff with a function that you probably most of you didn't feel very comfortable with that function. Agreed? Who did? But you study logarithms. You studied logarithms in algebra two. You studied them in pre-calculus, and here we are doing calculus on them. Okay. We had to do, we dealt with the transcendental number E, and we see that this one works and it works out lovely. The slope of both of these guys is approximately 0 0.2909. Okay, so that's the mean value theorem. Uh, how are we doing on time? We got 26. Uh-oh, we need to stop. I had one more example that's involving speeding in a car, but we're going to uh, skip that. Uh, let's go ahead and get rid of that. I'm going to stop my video and I want to talk to you briefly.